drafters of the Rome Statute designed this conference as the first opportunity to consider amendments. They were of the view that seven years of court operations should enable states to make informed decisions on whether changes to the Rome Statute were needed. Today, almost eight years after the entry into force of the statute and at the very beginning of this conference, we have already answered this question. The Rome Statute is a very solid treaty. It equips the court with all the tools necessary to carry out its mandate and there is no need for significant changes to the treaty. The discussions and amendments over the next two weeks will focus on issues mandated by the Rome Conference itself. No proposals for institutional changes are on the consideration and the fundamentals of the statute enjoy firm support. We can thus proudly say that we are looking at a functioning judicial institution that had eluded us for decades. The first independent permanent international criminal court with jurisdiction over the most serious crimes under international law. At the same time, we all can and we all must do better. The court itself and we as states parties. We have therefore added another dimension to this conference and will take stock both of the achievements to this day and of the challenges ahead of us. Four dimensions, victims and affected communities, peace and justice, complementarity and cooperation are at the very heart of the Rome statute system. Ladies and gentlemen, 12 years ago, world leaders gathered in Rome to establish the International Criminal Court. A few, a few could have believed then that this court would spring so vigorously into life, fully operational, investigating and trying war crimes and crimes against humanity across the bordering geography of countries. Seldom since the founding of the United Nations itself in 1945 has such a resounding blow uh, been struck for peace, justice, and human rights. Uh, today we come together for this first review conference of the Rome Statute. It is a chance not only to stake stock of our progress, but to build for the future. More, it is the one occasion to strengthen our collective determination that crimes against humanity cannot go unpunished, the better to deter them in the future. I see this as a landmark in the history of international criminal justice. The old era of impunity is over. In this place, slowly but surely, we are witnessing the birth of a new age of accountability. It began many decades ago with the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals. It gained the strength with the international criminal tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, as well as <coughs> the so-called hybrid tribunals in Sierra Leone, Cambodia, and Lebanon. Now we have the ICC, permanent, increasingly powerful, casting a long shadow. There is no going back. In this new age of accountability, those who commit the worst of human crimes will be held responsible. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the decisions you take this week will be felt around the world. Wherever there is injustice, wherever people live in fear, let us remember the mothers of Srebrenica and the old parts of Sierra Leone, the killing fields of Cambodia and Rwanda. So many terrible names, so many haunted places. 
Long ago we said never again. That is why this court exists. That is why we are here. That is what we have all worked so hard to achieve. The wrong statue represents the best that is in us, our most noble instinct. The instinct for peace and justice. In the days to come, I look forward to the assembly celebrating the achievements of the Rome Statue system. There is much to be proud of. We have come a long way since Rome in a very short time. Now is the time to trumpet a success. But this conference is also a time to reflect on the considerable work that lies before us to achieve the goals of the Rome Statue. Every year, the Assembly looks at the ICC and how it is functioning. But the ICC is only a small part of this large international criminal justice system. Without cooperation, there will be no arrest. Without cooperation, victims and witnesses will not be protected. And without cooperation, proceedings will not be possible. Without credible, fair domestic proceedings, the impunity gap will grow large. If victims and affected communities are not adequately engaged, the potential of justice will not be realized. And if peace and justice are not pursued hand in hand, we risk losing both. The court, international organizations, and civil society will all participate together with states parties and non-parties in the conference. But it is the state parties who have a special role this is your statute. You created it. You ratified it. And your decisions will greatly influence its success. There is great momentum behind you. I encourage you to keep going. Thank you very much. No military, no military commander, no political leader will be beyond which the International Criminal Court is casting a growing shadow. Each of its decisions will impact on at least 111 state parties and beyond. It's a new era, and the Secretary General has shown leadership by calling upon all of us, all of us for a collective effort to protect the victims, to end gender crimes, to ensure, to ensure that peace and justice work hand in hand. So, support by those in the state parties and non-parties, we are collecting evidence. The court issued a final warrant and one someone to appear. Each of them each of them against the top leaders of the group that allegedly committed crimes. Trials are progressing and the shadow of the court is extending beyond the parties, building up on a network of actors around the world, including NGOs and non state parties. The single monitoring of alleged crime by the Office of the Prosecutor in its preliminary examination phase is promoting national efforts to do justice. 
regardless of any final decision that Lubanga gets, militias in Nepal, in non-state party, have released 3,000 chazolis. The most important in the operation of France, armies all over the world are adjusting their operation standards, training, and growth of engagement to their own standards. This is a way to control violence. The law makes the difference between a soldier or a terrorist. Ladies and gentlemen, the future of international criminal jurisdiction <coughs> is the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. There should be no doubt about it. The continued progress and success of this landmark document will depend on several factors. Its sustained march towards greater universality, the effectiveness of the court's decisions, the ability of states to exercise their primary responsibility under the statute to investigate, prosecute, and punish, as well as strong political will on the part of political leaders and civil society. And questions of credibility will persist as long as three of the five eminent members of the Security Council refuse to consider their position and join those who have taken the courageous step to become parties to the statute. The same is valid for countries that aspire to permanent membership. Indeed, the problem is not limited to the Security Council. Six of the, 20, or six of the G20 have not ratified the Rome Statute. The state's parties to this historic statute must therefore pose the question, and it's an important question, what kind of leadership is this? What kind of leadership is this which would absolve the powerful from the rules they apply to the weak? A lack of leadership is no excuse. The state's parties to the Rome Statute are on the right side of history. You are in the majority. There must be no turning back, no slowing up on our journey. Ending impunity is a solemn pledge we are going to. Let us fulfill it so that when our grandchildren look back, they are not haunted by new voices from killing fiends yet to be named. Let them say to us that they rose to the challenge and built an international criminal court so strong, so powerful, so effective and universal that it protected the innocent by deterring even the most determined despot. 